it is not your aptitude which determines your altitude but it is your attitude which determines your altitude not your your skill or your talent or your expertise that will shoot you up to where you belong but it is your attitude it is your mindset it is the way you see things it is the way you react to things it is the way you handle things those those things are weightier they are very important and they are what the bible refers to as little little foxes we destroy the vine Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for a time like this that we can come and have fellowship with you, receive from you. Even as your word of life is coming, we pray that you will help us open our hearts to receive your word. Let your word grow and bear fruit in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. We thank God for today. And you are all welcome to church. Amen. Today is 30th July 2017. And, you know, uh, I say that I want to for this month, I want to look at certain things that we must do in our lives as Christians and to touch on certain um, practical issues of our Christian lives. And um, today, I want to talk on what I call lay aside the weight. Lay aside the weight. The weight. Uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. So we are looking at lay aside the weight. We want to look at some things that can hinder our progress as believers. There are certain things that can hinder our, hamper our growth and our progress. Um, the, the attainment of God's plans and purposes for our lives, there are certain things that God wants us to be mindful of. Um, these things are more of attitude now. They are more of attitude now. And attitude is very important in all things, in all that we do. There's a popular saying that it is not your aptitude which determines your altitude, but it is your attitude which determines your altitude. In other words, it is not your aptitude, not your your skill or your talent or your expertise that will shoot you up to where you belong, but it is your attitude, it is your mindset, it is the way you see things, it is the way you react to things, it is the way you handle things. Those 
those things are weighty. They are very important. And they are what the Bible refers to as little, little foxes who destroy the vine. It says that the little foxes destroy the vine. We can focus on the big, big foxes, you know, and then aim at the big foxes. But we must also sometimes look down and deal with the little, little foxes. Because they are the ones that are more dangerous. Because they sometimes you, you don't see them. And sometimes they happen on your blind side. So we need to ask God to help us to deal with these weights. Um, these weights, they can prevent us from running effectively. The race that God has set before us. The Bible says that, you know, like the analogy that the, the writer of the book of Hebrews was using was that of a runner, somebody who is running a race. And then he said there are certain things that will slow us down in our race. As we run the race, you can't you can run fast when you have weights pulling you down. Let's say you are contesting in a sports stadium and you are running a 100 meter dash and you are in suit and tie. I mean, obviously you can't run well. That's why you have to be as light as possible. You have to be in a vest, you know, and then with running shoes. In that case, then you can run very well. So we'll look at this weight. This weight, we call them success repellents. Success repellents. Just as we have mosquito repellents, we have success repellents, things that will repel good things from us. If we don't check them, they can repel good things if we don't check them. And when I say success, I'm talking about the progressive attainment of God's plans and purpose for your life. God will never stop blessing us, never stop thinking good for us, never stop designing beautiful things for us. But these ways, they can prevent us from entering into God's best. There's always God's best for us. There's always God's larger purpose and God's lesser purpose for every individual, you see. And some of these things, they can prevent us from entering into God's purpose, entering into God's best for us. So we may end up with God's uh, number two instead of getting number one from God. They can also make us ineffective in the hands of God and they can delay our destiny. They can also derail us from destiny's course if we don't give attention to them. So we are going to look at them. This this list is not exhaustive. In other words, these are not the only weights, but these are just a sample. It's a sample or a gist of the things that we have to deal with in our lives that can hinder our progress, but it's not exhaustive. Okay. So the first one we talk about is procrastination. Procrastination. Procrastination is a thief of time. That is what they say. So a stitch in time saves nine. Procrastination means to delay or postpone action. It is one thing that can rob us of our effectiveness in the things of God and even in our life, our lives as Christians. And everybody uh, has at one point or the other been a victim of procrastination. There are certain things that you, you see that you should have done them earlier but you procrastinated. And by the time you came to them, it was either too late or it was no longer useful. That is what procrastination will do to our lives. Now, God doesn't want us to do that. God wants us to do the right thing at the right time. When God tells us, move, we must move. When God says, do this at this time, we must do it. We must not procrastinate. And think that time is always on our side. We don't have the luxury of time. Time is not always on our side. 
every day, day in, day out, at the time that God has given us, it is eroding. In fact, any time you get up from bed, you are one day short of the number of days allotted to you. Any time you wake up from bed, you are one day short of the number of days allotted to you. If God is giving you 365 days, when you wake up from bed today, know that you are one day less, 365 days. And so we don't have time. So whatever we need to do, we must do it now. Because we have not been guaranteed even the next five minutes. Nobody has been guaranteed the next five. We don't know what's going to happen in the next five minutes. That's why sometimes there are certain things that if we don't do them now, they are meant for today. If you don't do them today, tomorrow, they may be a million miles away from us. And we will see that it's either too late or it's no longer useful. It's, it's not worth doing it anymore. In the Bible, when you read uh, Luke 9.61, you will see that Jesus didn't encourage that. There was a guy who had to follow the Lord, but he wanted to put it to a future date. And Jesus said, no, you can't do that. In Luke 9.61, he says, And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. He said, let me first go and say goodbye to my parents or to my household, you know, and then I will come and follow you. Then he said, no, the time to follow me is now. If you can't follow me now, forget about following me tomorrow. I mean, uh, the opportunity is just for now. So anytime God gives opportunity, God wants us to take advantage of them and maximize the opportunity because the window will not always be open. There are certain doors, there are time to certain times and seasons and they are open for a particular time, duration, period. Hello? So, we have not been guaranteed the next five minutes. Come to Proverbs 27 verse 1. Proverbs 27 verse 1. Procrastination, it's something that we must all deal with. There are a lot of things that we procrastinate, but sometimes we don't, we don't know the effects. We, we are robbed, you know, little here, little there, robbed of God's plans and purpose for our lives by procrastinating. Proverbs 27 verse 1. It says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Do not boast about tomorrow. What he's saying is that the main thing is today. Don't put it forth to tomorrow. Don't say that, oh, I will do it tomorrow. I will do it tomorrow. The time to do it is now. Yesterday is past. Tomorrow is not yet in. But today is what has been given to you. That's why I said, today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. The, 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 the time to listen to God is now. The time to listen to his voice is now. The time to implement what he's saying is now, not tomorrow. Time to do good is now. Proverbs 27, Proverbs 27, Proverbs, uh, open to Proverbs 27. Verse 3. Proverbs 20, sorry, Proverbs 3, 27. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do so. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. This is God's word to ask. He said the time to do good is now. I mean, you will not have the opportunity to do good all the time. But there comes a time when you have the means and the opportunity to make a difference in somebody's life, do it at that time. Don't postpone it. Because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We have not been guaranteed tomorrow. We have today to deal with. So he says, do not say that go and come tomorrow while you can do it today. He said, do it. 
if there is anybody that you must show kindness to, show it to him or her today. The Lord can speak to you and tell you, do this for this person. Don't delay. Do it. Don't delay. Just go ahead and do it because that is an opportunity. Maybe that's the only time you will get to bless the person. Maybe that's the only time that your giving will be fertile in the person's life. There are, there are a lot of times that you will do good to people and the good you do will not bear fruit. But the time when God opens, gives you the, the means, the ability, and the opportunity to come, the door is open, go through and be a blessing to somebody. There, 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 were, there have been times when God has asked me to bless people and I've delayed and I've seen that the time that I wanted to do that thing, it was too late. There was a particular time when God, I, I felt that I should bless somebody with something and I delayed. It wasn't for a long time. It was just, I delayed for like one day. Then that evening, the person sent me a video. And the video was a man of God who was speaking and was saying that if there's anybody you must do good to, do it now. <laughs> and, 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 and the person is a prophet, so maybe, I don't know. They immediately, I said, so it was like, when I sent the thing, I, I eventually did it, but it looked like it was because of the person's video so the person called again and said, oh, I didn't mean to tell you to do this. And I said, no, 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 no. I had been instructed, but I delayed. So that taught me that it is time, if God says do it, just do it. Just do it. Otherwise, uh, there may be other reasons why you can't do. For some people, time to say goodbye is now. Don't, don't, don't put it at a later date. Say goodbye. Time to get out of that relationship is now. <laughs> if, if it is a bad one, it's now is the time. Get out. Don't say tomorrow I will get out. Tomorrow. No, if you have a friend who is, who is leading you to hell, time to break that friendship is now. In Genesis 19 verse 16, Lot could not discern the time. So, the angel had to take his hand and pull him along. Because time to leave Sodom was now. But Lot was now. Now was the time that he was going, looking at the, the cross, the, the things he had planted, the, 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 the cattle and all that he was leaving behind. And the angels saw that he was delaying. So they took his hand and they pulled him out of the city because time to leave Sodom was then. Time to listen is now. If you have to listen to somebody, listen to him now. There are many people who should have done things they didn't do. They put it at a later date. Then they, could, they couldn't get opportunity again. There was a man in the 80s. They were speaking to this man and speaking to this man about giving his life to Jesus. And the man was always postponing. The time that he wanted to receive Jesus, he couldn't speak. Yeah, he was on the deathbed and they were speaking and doing mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he couldn't open his mouth and he died. Yes. So, take action now. Don't procrastinate. Come to John 9 verse 4. Look at Jesus. John 9 4. It says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. <laughs> he said, I must work the work while it is day. People say, make hay while the sun shines. While you have strength. You see, the reason why God gave us strength is for what we must do with the strength now. So don't waste the strength. Use it now. Don't waste the opportunity. Use it now. Any day you waste, you add to the evil days of your life. The Bible says the days are evil, so redeem the day. So it's like 100 evil days, and you are redeeming them one after the other. So any day you fail to redeem, that day will add to the evil 
days that are there. Time to act is now. Hebrews 3, 7. You can write it down. Time to act is now. Time to listen is, is now. Acts 17, 32. The people told Paul, he said, go and at the appropriate time we will listen to you. They didn't know that Paul was just, Paul was there for, 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 a, for a period. And they didn't have forever to listen to him. Ephesians 5. Let's read Ephesians 5, 6, 16 to 17. Ephesians 5, 16 to 17. It says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He said, verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Procrastination is very subtle, but it steals a lot of things from us. And most of the time, we don't, we don't see. We don't see, but it steals a lot of things. You know that you must do this thing, but it's like, it's like something keeps on telling you, oh, tomorrow is another day. No, no, no. Do it now. Do it now. Maybe the one sitting next to you, you must bless the person today. <laughs> Don't harden your heart. <laughs> Let God speak to you. Do it now. You see, when, when, when God touches your heart and the means is there and the opportunity is there, okay, come to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Galatians 6. Sorry, Galatians 6. Verse 9 and 10. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap it if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. As you have opportunity. Opportunity is chance. Time and chance happens to them all. Time and opportunity. As you have opportunity, you have the means. The door is open. Do it. Do it. Don't delay. When God asks you to give, don't delay. I remember uh, when I was in, in school, I pledged to uh, give an amount of money that I was expecting. It was a refund from the administration. And I said, I, I will give all. I will sow all into the church. When they released, the money delayed. When they released it, I was broke. So I said, I wanted to use the money. Then later on, I will find some money to uh, replace what I've used. Then I heard in my spirit, do not defer. Do not defer. And at that point, I knew it was a scripture, but I didn't know it offhand. So later on, I realized it was Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Let's go there. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. It says, do not defer. Chapter 5. Are you there? Okay. When you make a vow to God, verse 4, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. That was the scripture that came to my spirit. He said, do not defer. Then that was the King James. Defer not payment. When you have opened your mouth to tell God that, this money that I'm expecting, when it comes, I'm going to put this money, I'm going to give this money to this person or do that. Once you have opened your mouth, when it comes, do not delay. Some of these things, we may not see how they affect our lives as Christians, but I'm telling you, they really affect us. You see, we have, when, when you are teaching children, um, or you are with children, we have what we call teachable moments. There are some moments where the child can learn effectively. He can really catch what you are saying. There are some moments, for instance, 
when something crops up, when the child asks two questions, that's the time, that's one of the teachable moments to explain things to the child. Number two, when something crops up, it's also a teachable moment. If you let all those moments go and you don't take advantage of them, you will end up just lecturing to the child. But very little will go in. But when you take advantage of those teachable moments, you will see that the child will get it very well. Do you know why most of the things Jesus taught us, in fact, some of the most powerful revelations, they came as a result of the disciples' questions. So if they had not asked, you wouldn't have given them the revelation. Some of the most powerful teachings like Matthew 24, 25, the whole of Matthew 24, 25 came because Peter, Andrew, and one of them, I think James, went to Jesus and said, when will these things be? And what shall be the sign of the end of the, of the earth and of your coming? Then Jesus opened his mouth and spoke at length. All of Matthew 13 came as a result of questions they asked. So if you have something to ask, ask it now. <laughs> Otherwise, tomorrow will be too late. Number two, laziness. Laziness is the mother of procrastination. Yes, <laughs> laziness. And laziness means lack of zeal or drive to move. What science calls inertia. Inertia is the lack of zeal or drive to move. If inertia catches you, 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 are, you, are, at a, you are at a standstill. You can't move. That's laziness. And laziness too is a weight that can cost us. In fact, it can cost us even in the ministry. It can cost us in marriage. It can cost us in business. It can cost us in all aspects of our lives. Laziness. Sometimes you will feel that laziness is coming, coming upon you. That if you don't take care, laziness will catch you. And inertia will catch you. That's, that's, that's where you have to fight laziness. That's where you have to get up and move. Sometimes you have to ignore the body and move. Yes. I'll tell the body that, look, I'm going. If you won't go, stay here. <laughs> Me, I'm going. <laughs> laziness manifests itself in the love for sleep. Too much sleep means laziness. <laughs> People who sleep too much. <laughs> you know, I saw, I saw a quote yesterday on Facebook. I think it was, um, I, I, I forgot who sent it, but he said, sleep is good for the human body, but be, be careful when you sleep and where you sleep. Yes. It, it, it made a lot of sense to me because if if sleep is good, but it's not everywhere that you can sleep. How can you sleep on Lala's lap? <laughs> you know that your hair, your hair, your hair contains your strength. Then you are taking a nap on the Lala's lap. And he has, he has, she has a scissors, a pair of scissors. So too much sleep. Proverbs nineteen verse fifteen talks about that. Just too much sleep. All those in the Bible who were, who made impact, they were people who avoided too much sleep. Laziness cast one into deep sleep and an idle person will suffer hunger. It says laziness cast one into deep sleep but an idle, and an idle person will suffer hunger. So laziness is what will make you sleep and sleep and there are some people, they sleep in faces. They will get up, move around, eat, and come and continue. <laughs> and it's a weight that can affect us. If you don't take care, you oversleep. Yeah. And you see, 
sometimes I know that sometimes the body gets tied to the extent that, in fact, the alarm clock is not even enough. I mean, yeah, sometimes for me, yes, um, the day before yesterday, that day I got up at one. When I got up at one, I was so tired, very, very tired, because the previous day I had, I, had, I think I, I went to Korea or so, and I had, I have been doing, you know, there's something that, that what you, mental tiredness is, 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 is more t- tiresome than physical tiredness. <laughs> My mind was tired. <laughs> when I, when I, I would tell you together, when I got up at one, I went to my place to pray. But when I got there, my, the body was so weak. And I stayed for some few minutes and I came back to sleep. And I woke up around four, around five. Yeah. So, but you see, if it becomes a regular thing, then it means I am becoming lazy. Yes. If it becomes like every day I get up and I'm there, I'm tired. I have to know. There are times when the body must not detect you. Yes. You, you, you know you have something to do. Get up, gather the vein. You see, Sometimes sleep will be on your eyes, as we say, literally. And now we're on this one. <laughs> but you, know, you can take water and wash and wash and wash. And wash. They say that the eye itself, you know, so you have to do this. You have to hold, hold the eye, you know, hold the eye, the eyelid, open it. Say, but up today, you have to stay awake. You can't sleep. So laziness is something that we must avoid. Be an early riser. Jesus was an early riser, Mark 135. Joshua was an early riser, Joshua 6.12. Moses, an early riser, Exodus 8.20. Abraham was an early riser, Genesis 19.27. Don't say, I am not the morning type. No. Wake up early. Wake up early. Get up early. People who get up early, they seize the day. This is the day. Get up early to be with your maker, be with your, with your God, receive your ideas, receive your instructions, receive the strength for the day. Then you can charge on the day. So how to avoid laziness? Number one is be an early riser. Number two, do not see work as punishment. Somebody went to somebody's farm and said, oh, look at this beautiful farm. Oh, God has done what they said. This is not God. I did it. Let me show you what God did. They took him to another farm where there were weeds. <laughs> he said, this is God's farm. <laughs> Do you know why? Because this farm, nobody was working it. And the person was waiting for God to work it. And God worked it that way. God caused the rain to fall. And the weeds were growing. So, labor. People sometimes think that when we say somebody has a good marriage, it means that the person is lucky or the person uh, was lucky to get a good marriage. No, no, no. It is work. You must labor to get it. Oh, yes. You must labor. I was telling some people that, look, if you want a reason to, 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 to destroy your marriage, you will get a reason to do that. Yes, you always get a reason to do that. If you want to destroy the marriage, you will always get a reason to do that. It is labor. You must work it. Relationships are serviced. You don't leave relationships like that. The fact that you've married the person doesn't mean that that's all. No. You must keep it working. Keep the relationship going. You must keep the communication going. It is work. You must make sure that you are concerned, interested about what is going on in the person's life. It's work. If you leave things like that, things will be like that. Ministry involves labor. The Bible says, let the elders be counted worthy of double honor who labor in word and doctrine. It's labor. If you are doing ministry, you must labor. You labor in prayer. You labor in the word. You labor 
in doing what God has called you to do. You labor, you, you labor in doing it. Do you know that love is a labor? Bible talks about the labor of love. Labor of love. He said the work of faith, the, the patience of hope, and the labor of love. Do you know how people are laboring for love? You don't know. <laughs> Ask Jacob. Jacob spent uh, how many years? 14 years for one woman. 14 years. When you meet the guys, ask them. Ask those who are laboring for love. <laughs> you will be tight if you should forget the birthday. <laughs> that is labor. You know, I saw, I saw one joke on WhatsApp. They said that the man was 90 years old and he was calling his wife, honey, sweetheart, uh, darling. Then somebody said, Oh, what a beautiful couple. How are you able to do that? 90 years, you are still calling your wife sweetheart. He said, I forgot her name 10 years ago. <laughs> and I'm afraid to ask her. <laughs> that is laboring in love. You then, you dare not forget. You must remember. And you see, for the guys, you see, you must learn how to remember special events. Learn it now. Learn how to remember birthdays and events. Just that one you shouldn't, shouldn't feel. Just make sure that one you pass. <laughs> you see, I, well, I'll, I'll, I, I can give you the rules so that you write them in a book. Then you start learning. <laughs> now, the Greek word for poor is pokus. And it means non-productivity. So to be poor doesn't mean you don't have anything. It means you are not producing anything. You are not laboring. Create a schedule for yourself. Force yourself to do something. If even nobody has given you any duty, ability, create one for yourself and stick to it and do it. Create a timetable for yourself and stick to it and go by it. For yourself for the day. Timetable for your Bible studies, for your prayer. Timetable for the things you want to do. Create it and follow it. You see, we don't wait for somebody to come and tell you that, do this, do that. No, 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 no. You can create something for yourself and do it. I mean, you might be producing something. We sometimes say that God God rested after creating and forming for six days, right? And on the seventh day, he rested. But Jesus Christ said in John 5, 17, he said, my father is still working. He is still working. God is always busy. He said, but Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Jesus was the, one of the most hard-working people you find in scripture. You see, because he knew that he had limited time, he was almost working himself, you know, working himself out. Wearing himself out. Always, was always about the father's business. Sometimes he would be so tired that the, his family members would come and take him from the crowd so that he's, he's mad. He has not eaten since morning. And all he's doing is he's preaching and teaching and healing. That was his work. And he was about his father's business. He was laboring. He got to a point. Look at his shadow. Matthew 8 verse 1. Let me, let me give you Jesus' shadow. A typical day. The things he did in a typical day. Matthew 8 verse 1. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And so he came down from the mountain. Okay. Verse 5. Now when he had entered Capernaum, so he, he did what? He entered Capernaum. Come to verse 14. Now when he had come into Peter's house, he went to Peter's house. Come to verse 23. 23. Now when he had got into a boat, the disciples followed him. So he went to a boat 
and he crossed to the other side. Come to verse 25. 28. When he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesins, there met him two demon possessed men. He went to the other side. In a typical day, he was a very busy person. Very, very busy. From this, he would do that. From that, he would do that. From this. And, and one would have thought that he had to rest because he was given the spirit without measure. But he said, I can never rest. He said, for as long as it is day, I must do my father's business. So, laziness is a weight. There are some people, they are always late. Because of laziness, they are always wait, uh, late. It becomes a weight on the person. That sometimes you will miss important events, important opportunities. You will miss them. Because of laziness. And you, and you, you may think that, oh, I, 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 God is not speaking. But the opportunity was there. And because you were not diligent and you were lazy, you missed the opportunity. Laziness is a weight. We must not be lazy. We must always be up and doing. You see some people, the way they will even walk to church, casually. I mean, as if they are chiefs who are coming and they have their uh, ahenkwa <laughs> and they are walking casually. Coming to church, you are late. You must be walking briskly. Somebody was saying that he went to Nigeria, uh, uh, UK. Then he saw two black people. Then he said, he saw them in the supermarket. Then he said he saw one of them came very, very briskly walking. Pa, 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 pa. You go and pick this. Then first you go and pay for it. Then you go out. Then another person came. He was just walking leisurely, conversing. You hold this. Look at the price. Then he said he could tell that one was a Nigerian, one was a Ghanaian. <laughs> and he said, true to his suspicion, the Ghanaian was a Ghanaian and Nigeria was a Nigerian. <laughs> so, so be, because the, the person has a, a very um, laid back attitude towards life that, oh, every, no. We must become aggressive in what we believe in. Become aggressive. You are able to move just at, at, at a minute's notice. Otherwise, you will miss certain opportunities. There have been times that I have received calls to come to Accra. And I received the call in the evening. I have to go the following morning. Eh, so you must go. You must go. If you love too much sleep, you will oversleep. You, you will miss a lot of things that God has brought your way. You will miss them. Lateness is bad. We need to discourage lateness in everything. Number three, ignorance. Ignorance is something that can also cost us in all that we do. Ignorance means having no knowledge or awareness. Hosea 4 says, my people, not unbelievers, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. The word destroy means needless pain or death. My people are in needless pain because they lack knowledge. We must understand that life is a product of light. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So, whatever God wa- wants you to do, it will not come as a result of lack, L-U-C-K. It will come as a result of light. The more light you have, the brighter you shine. You cannot outshine, you know, the amount of light you have in you. So, we need to get knowledge 
pray for understanding so that we can be wise. In everything, we must pursue knowledge. We must, we must be people who love knowledge. T- today's Christian loves entertainment more than information. You will see many Christians with little information. We need to have information. Information that will also lead to transformation. Spiritual knowledge. One of the things that is, that is plaguing the church is biblical illiteracy. People don't have knowledge at all. Paul said, I say this to your shame, that some of you do not have a knowledge of God. You should get knowledge. Anywhere in your life that light shines, freedom comes. Because the authentic proof of knowledge is freedom. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. There are certain things that will come your way, but if you don't know, have, have any knowledge about it, you will not be able to, to, to succeed in operating it. Come to Psalm 119 verse um, 105. We must have a knowledge of the word. You must have a knowledge of the word. 119 verse 105. It says, um, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Then verse 130 also says, the entrance of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. It says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. And the entrance of your word gives light. Light comes from the word. The more word you have, the more light you have, the more freedom you have, the more impact you make. One more nine, verse one o four. He said, "Through your precepts, I gain understanding, and therefore I hate every false way." Your knowledge, you see, knowledge is when you accumulate information. That one is very important. Very important. If you don't have knowledge, you will not have understanding. You see, that that knowledge, if you want spiritual knowledge, that's why God God gave us the Bible. Before Adam fell, what happened was that Adam walked by revelation knowledge. After the fall of man, when the spirit of man became hidden, became the hidden man of the heart, God gave us the, the written word so that he can get to us from outside to inside. So your, your five senses, your eyes will see the word and read it and you process it and it will go, go down into your heart and the spirit will pick it and use that to change you from the inside out. That is why if you don't know what is written in the word, it's likely you cannot hear God when he speaks to you. So knowledge is very important. Very, very important. He said, through your precepts, I gain understanding. And therefore, I hate every false way. I hate every false way. It's understanding that keeps us on the right path. Understanding. That's why I said that in, in, in Proverbs 6.32, he said, it is understanding that will keep you from the strange woman. Understanding. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32. It says, Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. It means you lack understanding. Because understanding is like this. Seeing something from God's perspective. That's understanding. Anytime we see differently from God, we are deceived. Anytime you and God, you don't see the same way you are deceived. So, if you really understand why God says, do not uh, commit adultery or fornication, you will not do that. How do we get knowledge? Read. Cultivate the habit of reading. 
Many believers don't like reading. There's a saying that if you want to hide something for a black man, put it in a book. If you want to hide something from a black man, put it in a book. It's not true. But if you want to hide something from today's believers, put it in a book. Because they will never read. Today's believers want excitement more than information. But I'm telling you, reading, reading will give you many benefits that preaching will not give you. Teaching, Sunday after Sunday teaching alone is not enough. It, uh, that one is not enough. Because that one is more like a general food. But when you cultivate the habit of reading, reading the Bible, reading Christian literature, just reading, the habit of reading is very, very important. Reading, just reading. There are many people, if you quantify the, the, the things that are on their body, it will run into several hundreds of cities. They have never bought any Christian book. It's serious. Never bought even one Christian book to, to read. I mean, we should be gathering books. We should place emphasis on knowledge because it's very important. Do you know why sometimes we de-emphasize knowledge? Because we think that knowledge and power, they are mutually exclusive. You can have one and leave the other. The two go together. Spend time reading the Bible. The Bible itself. Let's spend time reading the Bible. Apart from that, there are good books that have been written. Read them. Get them to read. If you don't know what is written, you'll be written off. Mm. It will take you approximately 56 hours to read the Bible. If you read 40 chapters a day, you will take 30 days to finish reading the Bible. I mean, every believer, make it your goal that you will go through the Bible once a year. I mean, go just, just read. If not for anything, just reading. Just read it. Once a year, you will go through the entire Bible. Once a year, just read it. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a big thing. Once a year, going through the entire Bible. You can do it. Yeah. You can decide to go through. I, I go through the Old Testament once a year. But I go through the New Testament several times a year. But for the Old Testament, I go through once a year. Every year, I go through once. That is reading, not studying. Just reading. Just reading the Bible. We must, because it, reading the Bible itself brings blessings. Check Revelation. Said those who read the words of this prophecy, they are blessed. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 5. It said, A man of knowledge increases strength. The more you know, the stronger you become. Proverbs 24, verse 5. A wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. Jesus was a reader. You see, Bible said that uh, when Satan came to tempt him, he quoted scriptures. He was a reader. He was somebody who was addicted to reading. The son of man, the word himself, when he came, he was addicted to the word. The word himself, when he became flesh, he was addicted to the written word. Daniel 9 verse 2. Daniel said, I understood by the books about the prophecy that Jeremiah, Jeremiah gave. He said, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, I understood by the books the number of years specified by the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he will accomplish 70 years in the resolutions of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests. How can you imagine that, that Daniel was in captivity and God had said it will last for 70 years. In fact, it went beyond 70 years. 
But Daniel saw, he discovered it in the books by reading. He was always searching, reading the books. Then he found that, ah, God spoke through Jeremiah that our captivity will last of 70 years. Why are we still here? Then he began to make intercession and supplication. Because he discovered it in the books. He read it. Whatever you want to do, acquire knowledge about it. Read. Don't just get up and say, I'm going to marry. Read about marriage. Yeah, read about marriage. Get some good knowledge about marriage. Don't think that it's not spiritual. I only want to read about Holy Spirit. Read about marriage also. <laughs> yeah. Read about books that will, if you are in business also, read about books that will help you do business. Don't despise knowledge in any form. Do research. Take time and read. The reason why sometimes we ensnare ourselves, we don't take time to read. When you are entering into agreement with the bank, they will come with a long, you know, a very voluminous, and they will say, sign here. <laughs> you are signing your own death warrant. You don't know. Because you don't have time to read it. Hallelujah. What about Paul? Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 13. Paul was a reader. No wonder Paul gave us two thirds of the New Testament. He was somebody who read. He took time to read. It wasn't just like receiving revelation. There are certain things God will not give to you directly. There are certain things you will see, you, you will get from other people. There are certain truths you will get from other people. So if you if you if you don't read, you will miss you will miss certain things. Second Timothy four thirteen. Paul was he said that um, bring the cloak that I left with Capus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. He said bring the books and the notebooks, the ones that I've I've made notes in. Bring them. That was Paul. Very studious. Always studying. Look at that. The revelation that Paul had. He was still studying. Still reading the scripture. Searching the scripture. Because if you don't study, God will not open your understanding. Revelation doesn't drop from the sky. Revelation comes when you open the book and study it. Then the Holy Ghost will breathe into you. Then you understand. Then he will connect this one to that one. Then you will throw light into your heart. Then you will see. Then it happens. Then you are transformed. Invest in books. Invest in books. Spend money to buy. If you spend money to buy a book to read, you have not wasted your money. Spend money to buy a book to read. We always want to to watch and listen. We also have to read. Read. Gather the facts. Whatever you want to do, just gather the facts. Before you take a decision, gather the facts. Make sure you are well acquainted with the facts. Gather them. Do your research. Sometimes when you read, when I started reading autobiographies and biographies, I realize that most of the things that we go through in ministry, they are normal. Many people have gone through them before. When you read people's autobiography, the thing that you want to do, somebody has done before. And the person has put all his experience and thoughts in a book. So get that book and read it. And what has, what has taken somebody 30 years to to, to, to to know, you can take hours to get it just like this. When, whenever you are reading a book, you are rubbing your mind against the mind of the author. You get to know what is in the heart of the author. That is when you, you, you really get understanding. A knowledgeable servant will rule over an ignorant prince. A servant who is knowledgeable will rule over a prince who is ignorant. 
Because the servant knows everything about the, 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 your, your father's house. He knows this, this key opens this door. You are a prince of the house. You don't know. You know, this key opens this door. This, one, this thing is here. This, and the prince doesn't know. We have a kingdom of ignorant kings. Wearing a crown doesn't make you a king necessarily. But when you know, and you, you only know when you research, when you read. Don't let any month go by without you reading a book. Every point in time, there must be a book you are reading. Let, let that habit, cultivate that habit. Every point in time, there must be a book that you are reading. But you don't just read anything. You, you have to be led and guided. The fourth one is lack of clear vision. Lack of clear vision. Proverbs 29 verse 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. The people cast off restraint. The people live anyhow where there is no vision. A vision is a mental picture of God's plan and purpose for your life. What God has spoken to you about your life, you must get the picture and focus on the picture. That is what God has spoken to you about your life. And God is very mindful of vision. In Genesis 15:1, Abraham was in the tent and God said, Abraham, get out of the tent and go outside. And God showed him the stars of the heavens. He said, can, can you count them? He said, so shall your descendant be. God had to bring him out of the tent because the tent will limit his vision. It will limit how far he can see. So, what God has spoken concerning your life, you must visualize it and you must, you must expand the horizon, the limits of it. Hallelujah. The right vision is one unique passion that God will give you, which you cannot shake off. You cannot shrug it off. You cannot run away from it. It may not be important to others, but to you, it is an all-consuming desire. That thing that God has given you, that is the vision. It is the ability to anticipate, prepare, and make provision for what God has said concerning your life. So, the thing that God has spoken to you about your life, what are you doing at present to make sure that you are on the path to achieving it? You understand what I'm saying? What God has spoken to you concerning your life for the future, what are you doing in the present that shows that you are on the path to that future? That is how, that is, that is, that is the, the vision I'm talking about. It brings together hindsight, which is past. Insight is now. Foresight is before. Farsight is the future. Oversight is provision. A real vision from God will demand order in your life. It will demand order in your life. When you catch a glimpse of what God intends to do in your life, it will demand order in your life. It will demand that you order your life well. The reason, the reason why young, young, young girls in the, in the days of, 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 of Mary were, were abstaining from all those things and, and trying to be virgins was because of that way which is a virgin shall conceive. When God spoke that word, God didn't mention Mary's name. So everybody was trying to become the one. 
So your vision must demand order in your life. What helped Joseph to ignore Potiphar's wife was the vision of the sun and the moon and the stars bowing to him. So he saw that and he said, how can I exchange that for this? God has shown me that uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars are bowing to me. How can I bow to Potiphar's wife? He said, how can I do this? God has prepared a throne for you. And Potiphar's wife is trying to give you a seat. Because anything that is able to distract you from your God-given vision is stronger than your vision. Focus on it. Give it your all. Habakkuk 2 verse 2. It says, write down the vision. Document it. Document it. What God has spoken concerning your life. Write it down. Document it. Make it plain. Establish the purpose, the plan that God has given you. Note the process you will go through. The principles that apply to you. The pattern, those who have been there before. People that you will need. The price to pay and the price at stake. I'll talk about eight P's sometime later. Purpose, plans, process, principles, pattern, people, price, and price in everything, anything you do. Then you take a step in line with that vision. Subject the vision to the scrutiny of mature counsel. There are things that God has spoken to in your life not everybody qualifies to hear it. But Bible says in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Let me, let me move faster. Number three. Is it three? Five. Fear. Fear is also something that we must deal with. Otherwise, we can miss our opportunities miss our destiny. Somebody defined fear as false evidence appearing real. Fear. Fear can cripple you and can prevent you from moving forward in your life. We should always confront fear, not allow fear to rule our lives. Fear means believing in Satan's ability to inflict pain or to hurt you. That is fear. Faith is believing in God's ability. Fear is believing in Satan's ability. There are certain types of fear that can prevent us from doing God's will. The first one is fear of rejection. It can prevent you from moving forward in your God-given vision and destiny. Moses asked God, what about if I go and they don't accept me? God said, go and tell them the God of your father has appeared to me. He said, what about if they don't accept me? That was fear. Fear of rejection. If you fear rejection, you can't do anything for God. If you are afraid of what people will say, whether people will receive you or reject you, there are certain things that God has asked you to do. If you look at people's faces, you can't do them. <laughs> it's true. It's true. You can look at somebody's face and what God has asked you to do, you will shelve it. Fear of the future. Fear of the future it's something that can also cripple us and prevent us from moving forward because we are afraid of the future. Me- meanwhile, we don't, we don't know the future. Fear of the future is anxiety. It's unnecessary worry. People have anxiety about their future. That is not faith. We all don't know what is going to happen tomorrow, but we know that God holds tomorrow. That should be the attitude that I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I know who holds tomorrow. 
You see, the devil can paint a very bleak picture of your future. Then, instead of you to believe the word, you are believing the bleak picture that Satan is painting for you. And he is giving you pictures after pictures of failure, of defeat, of all those things. And you are staying at one point, crying over something that has not begun yet. (laughs) So Jesus said, which of you can add one cubit to his stature by worrying about tomorrow? He said, if you can do this little thing, (laughs) he called that a little thing. He said, adding one cubit to your stature is a little thing to God. (laughs) Jesus, he said, if you can't do this little thing. <laughs> do you know how people are praying to get taller? He said, this is a little thing. <laughs> people are praying to grow taller. He says, it's a little thing. And by saying that, if you can't do this little thing, don't worry about tomorrow. What you eat, what you wear, where life will place me. Some people are, you, you are, you see, when <laughs> he said, So, what is my life going to be? I fear I may not get a good marriage. I fear I may not get a job after school. I fear I may not last in the ministry. I fear I may fail. No, allow fear. That is unnecessary fear. The word of God says, he said, I know the thoughts I think towards you. They are thoughts of good, not evil. To give you a hope and a future. Don't you believe that? So, fear of the future is an indication of lack of faith, not wisdom. Look at Paul's secret. Come to 2 Timothy 1.12. Paul's secret. The devil will use these things to bully you. If you don't understand the word of God. Second Timothy 1 12. It says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. Have you committed your life to God? Have you committed your future to him? Leave time. Worry about the future. Number two, fear of man. Proverbs 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man is a snare. Fear of man is a snare. Saul so in the Old Testament. His main problem was the fear of man. Come to 1 Samuel 15, 24. 1 Samuel 15, 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I fear the people and obey their voice. Pressure of the people. It can make you sin against God. Sin against your generation because of fear of what man will do to you. All these types of fear, they will make you sin against your generation. Deny you of your destiny. The devil is a liar. Fear of responsibility. Fear of responsibility is also a type of fear that will also limit us in our in the pursuit of destiny. Do you know why people fear, fear to take responsibility? Because they, they are afraid to fail. If you are afraid to fail, you cannot take any step for God. If you are afraid to fail, you can't do anything for God. And it means you are proud. Because you are thinking about yourself and about you are are weighing your strength 
and telling yourself that I will fail. But God says, look at me. Looking unto Jesus, not looking unto yourself. The one who got one talent, he said, I was afraid. So he buried the talent because he was afraid. He was afraid to take risk. <laughs> Calculated risk. Life is full of risk. But you must take calculated risk. Don't take foolish risk. Calculated risk is when you gather the facts and you know. Then you acknowledge God also. You consult God. It gets to a point. God will never bring you to a point where you wouldn't need an element of risk. Whatever you do. There will always be a point where you must move without seeing the whole picture. Whatever God asks you to do, he will always ask you to do something and he will not give you the full, he will never give you the full picture. You will always have to move by faith. That's an element of risk. But that risk is calculated risk because God said so. God said move. When Peter said, Lord, if it is you, command, tell me to come. Then he said, come. Then it was not left for Peter to step out. He said, come. He didn't say, come, I've made the, I've turned the sea into dry land or a solid ground, so come. No. He said, as you see the waves tossing and rising and falling, come. <laughs> yeah. So, for Peter to step out of the boat and put his feet on the water, that was risk. But the risk was calculated because it was Jesus who said, come. So, in that sense, risk is faith. When you believe that God says move, move. Even if you don't see the full picture, you don't see anything, just move. Fear of losing immediate benefits. It's also a fear that can prevent you from fulfilling your destiny. Fear of losing immediate benefits. John 12, 42. John 12, 42. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Talking about uh, Jesus and the people who were following him. There are people who were among the rulers like uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who could not openly follow Jesus. Even though they believed in him but they were afraid that they would be put out of the synagogue. So they couldn't openly follow him. Fear of Im losing immediate benefits. It can cripple you. See, fear has torments. When Joseph said no to Potiphar's wife, he lost immediate benefits in the house. In fact, he even, it even landed him in prison. But that didn't stop Joseph. If you are afraid to lose immediate benefits, you can never take any risk for God. If you are afraid to lose immediate benefits, you can never take a stand for God. When Daniel said, I will not defile myself with the king's food, there were some immediate benefit that Daniel lost. He will get some enemies and get some friends. It is normal to get enemies in life. Don't think everybody will like you. <laughs> you are mistaken if you think everybody will like you. No, but some will like you. Whatever God wants you to do, just do it. By doing it, you will get enemies and you will get lovers. But don't be distracted by enemies. Jesus had enemies. And he had lovers. He spent more time with the lovers. He didn't spend, he didn't mind the enemies. 
the Pharisees and all those. He didn't, he didn't mind them. He was always with the crowd. Always with the twelve. Those were his lovers. The others were his enemies. And whatever you do for God, you will always get enemies. You always get lovers. Don't get worried. When people hate you, sometimes you can do a good thing for somebody. The person will see you as an enemy. Don't be worried. Keep doing it. A time will come, he will, the person will understand. Last but one, wrong association. Wrong association. One of the ways that will pull you down is the people you work with. Proverbs 13 verse 20, it said, he that is wise. Let me read. Proverbs 13 verse 20. He who works with wise men will be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. First Corinthians 15 33. Do not be deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. It says, do not be deceived. Don't think that you can work with somebody who is a fool and you will not become a fool. He said, if you do that, you are deceived. Because evil communication, they will corrupt your good manners. That is why you must work with like-minded people. Anybody who's not going your direction, away. Yeah. How can you go this, go, go right and somebody will go left and you will make progress? No. The, this one will pull this one to the right. This one will pull this one to the left. And you will end up standing at, at one point, not moving. That is why the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. People will come into your life and they will feed you. Others will come and pollute you. Avoid people who come into your life to pollute you. He says, blessed the one who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Avoid bad advice. Ungodly advice. People who give ungodly advice. Evil advices. Like Jonadab, the brother, uh, the, the, the cousin of Amnon. Who saw him and said, Ah, why are you growing lean? A king's son. Then he said, I'm in love with my sister Tama, but I can't say it. <laughs> Sometimes people are growing lean. You have to investigate. <laughs> Maybe they can't say it. <laughs> but you know what Jonathan, what Jonathan said? He said, Pretend that you are sick. Let Tama, uh, and tell the king to let Tama come and cook for you. That was a wicked counsel. Wicked advice. Anybody who advises you and gives you bad advice, you must avoid that person. Yes. You must advise, because people don't want to go down alone. Yeah. Let's say, as we are here, somebody is here. Now, the person has issues with another person and the person comes to you the person tries to poison you against that other person have you seen this person he has done meanwhile the person has done nothing against you 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 and the person there's nothing wrong you know, between the two of you but the person wants you to also hate this other person so he starts saying bad things about this person to you you are this person, you have done this, I have done that, you done that, this, 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 Then when he gains you, then the two of you become partners. You will always be talking and discussing other people. Avoid such people. Avoid them because if I have not, you, you have not done anything against me and somebody is trying to convince me that you, you are bad, because maybe you had a problem with the person. Avoid the one who is, is giving you bad, is poisoning your heart. 
We have people, we call them value-reducing agents. VRA. <laughs> they will reduce your value. Avoid VRAs. They are tonic friends and toxic friends. Toxic friends, they are dangerous. They pollute you. Tonic friends, they, they feed you. They encourage you. There are some people, they are, they are vision killers. They have the ministry of discouragement. They will discourage. <laughs> you see, a good friend is number one, selfless. Proverbs 17, 17. You say, a friend laughs at all times. Selfless person is a good friend. Number two, he is steadfast. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Steadfast. Not people who are fair weather friends. For as long as he can get something from you, he's your friend. When he can't get anything from you, he avoids you. Fair weather. Sacrificial friends. Proverbs 18.24 They sacrifice. They are willing to sacrifice for you. That is a friend. In the same way, you too must be a friend. You too must be selfless, steadfast, and sacrificing. Sanctifying. Proverbs 27 verse 12. It says, As iron sharpened iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Proverbs 27 verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. The wounds of a friend, they are faithful than more faithful and they are better than the kisses of an enemy. A friend who, somebody who can tell you, hey, what you are doing is wrong. Be careful. He is your friend. He can tell you that. He can tell it to your face. What you are doing is wrong. Everybody must have people in your life who can tell you you are wrong. Otherwise, you are in danger. Otherwise, you are in danger. If you, nobody can tell you you are wrong, you are in danger. Yeah. So, if in your circle of friends, nobody can speak to you and tell you, Jack, you are wrong. You are on the of the You must have people around you who sometimes you fight. You fight with them because you tell the truth. <laughs> sometimes you will fight with them. You see, that's a friend. He will tell you the truth to your face. This is wrong. And if you listen, it will help you. If you don't listen, you later on regret. But you will see that this was a friend. Be careful of friends who are always accountable. Not it's not possible. And also be careful of those who are always seeing negative about you, not applauding you. <laughs> the last one. So you see, then when I say VRA, then you must also have value inspiring people, VIP. They inspire value. Like Mary and Elizabeth. He said, when I heard your salutation, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. That is a friend. The last one that I'll talk about today is failure to acknowledge God. That is one thing that can easily bring us down. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. He said, commit your ways unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall cause it to come to pass. For without him, we can do nothing. There's a saying that your efficiency without God's sufficiency is only a deficiency. Very, very true. Proverbs 21 verse 31. I'll read this last scripture. Proverbs 21 verse 31. 
The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. That is why you must not just live your life as if you don't have any God. Acknowledge God. In all you do, acknowledge God. Consult God. Seek his opinion. Seek his advice. No matter how mundane or ordinary what you are doing is, no matter how ordinary it is, acknowledge God. He said, except the Lord builds the city, the builders build but in vain. So builders are building, but they must know at the back of their mind that God is the one building. Watchman is watching, but they must know that except the Lord watches over the city, the watchman, they watch, but it's in vain. James 4, 13 to 16. It says, those of you who say tomorrow we'll do this and do that, we'll travel to this city and that city and we'll live there and make money. He said, what, he said, he said, what is your life? He said, you should have said, if God permits me, which means that, what he's saying is that you should not remove God out of your calculation. There are some people, all they need is an opportunity. God will never come in. Once the, once the door opens, that's all. Somebody was telling me that if they bring a ship right now and they say, second slave trade, we, are, we want slaves to go to America. I said, I will go. <laughs> I said, slave. He said, oh, yes. He said, Master, for as long as it is not Ghana, <laughs> I will go. <laughs> but you see, some people can make it in America. Others will not make it in America. So the issue is not America. The issue is, what is God saying? Acknowledge God. Let's pray. We want to pray and tell God. We, we need grace. We need wisdom. We need understanding. We need the mercy of God. We need the favor of God. We need all those things. Pray. Let's pray. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Give us grace, O oh God. Give us grace. Give us favor. O oh God, have mercy on us, O oh God. Give us grace. Give us understanding, wisdom. In all our affairs, wisdom in all the affairs of our lives, in the name of Jesus, that we will know how to order our life, order our steps, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Lord. 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 Help us to lay aside the weight. Help us to put away the weight. Anything that will hinder us from moving forward in our lives, in our destiny. Anything that will cripple us. Anything that will prevent us from running effectively. Help us, Lord, open our eyes to see. Help us to move forward. Help us to run effectively. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are praying this prayer. We are praying for strength, 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 spirit, supernatural strength, strength in our inner man to be able to stand in these times. Let's pray. Strength, oh God, strength to stand, strength to stand, strength to be immovable, strength to be always abounding, immovable, always abounding, steadfast, resilient in the name of Jesus. Koria Talabahasa, Libra Toloboje, Maki Braha Talamasi, Mokete Ketiha, Oh, yes, Lord, Kobri Hidahasi, Vliki Tonyana Shamaha, Vlinga Tuzi Hede, Ripi Katalamadasi, Tolia Tetis, Mikro Totozi Breheta, Oh, yes, Lord, Koli Bahandem, Thank you, Lord, Thank you, Lord, 
Thank you, Lord. 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 In the name of Jesus. Lain Grodo Zibre Hetes. Vilinga Tanamahas. Bokata Yandis. Inga Telele Shikehete. Kratatana Si Nalahata. Ropalaya Tere Heshe. Mandere Kashi. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are praying this prayer for the nation. We are praying that the hand of God will continue to be on this nation where Ghana has gotten to in her destiny. God is about to release prosperity on the nation. And we are praying that our leaders will be wise. God will give them wisdom that they will not miss opportunities that God will lead them, connect them to sound advice. We are eliminating wrong people from around them. And we are asking God to bless every good idea they have. Any wicked idea they will conceive. Let that idea perish. Let's pray. In the name of Jesus, we bring our leaders before you. Father, bless every good idea. Every good idea they have. Any idea that will help that will help this nation to move forward into your plan and purposes. Bless the God. We curse every evil idea. Any evil idea that will spring in their hearts, that will spring in their minds, we curse it to die. In the name of Jesus, let your hand, O God, be upon this nation. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Father, we bless you. We thank you. We pray with God that you will help us. Help us in our face of this life. Grant us wisdom. Open our eyes, O God. Help us to run effectively the race that has been set before us. In Jesus' name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.